Hello, my friend. I'm glad to see you made it. We're gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He's alive. Today, my friends, I was going to talk a little bit about the exodus of Israel and the God's people coming out of Egypt and how that relates to our lives today, you know, and how it relates to our salvation and how God's salvation is working in each of our lives each and every day, whether we choose to believe Him or, or not. He's still working in our lives. Same with Pharaoh and Egypt, they chose not to believe God, and, and yet God still was working through their lives as he was working to release Israel from the bondage. Now, God didn't just, you know, decide I, I'm going to, you know, run down into Egypt and free my people. Rather, it was the people who decided, and through the anguish of life, cried out for help. And what created the situation of the affliction? Well, when you go to Egypt in that day and age, you know, it's a mighty empire. <clears throat> and it's no different than us today. Some people say that there must have been two million or plus or so amount of people who left Egypt. It was a great society. Could you imagine growing food? You know, we eat three meals a day. I'm sure back in that day they ate three meals a day. Could you imagine producing enough food for, let's say, six million or so people every day without a tractor? Without the, the amenities we have today. Just a, a hoe and some elbow grease and a lot of people digging fields, growing crops, taking care of the sheep, things like that. And in all of it, they're, they're building pyramids and building homes and, uh, you know, they're not just living in a tent anymore. They're building homes out of bricks, a, a, a permanent way of life. It's same like here today in, in our world. You know, everybody was working away, but, but in it, this creation of a society or a city or an empire in itself became a burden, in itself became slavery. And the Jews or, or the Israelites were not the slaves of Egypt, you know, when Joseph came, they, they had an equal partnership in, in all the things of Egypt. You know, the, the Israelites were good at <coughs> carving the, the images of the Egyptians or the pharaohs into stone. They, they were good at building houses, that they had architectural ability, that they were good at being shepherds and taking care of the cattle and the sheep and everything about it. And they traded their goods for Pharaoh's protection. So so they're all living under the protection of Pharaoh's army. There's nothing there to hurt them or, or to harm them other than the, the slave labor that they basically put upon themselves as a whole society. Same as we are today, you know, we think we are free. But how free are we? How free are we? I, I've you no, know, in my personal life, you know, I've worked uh, five years or the past five years of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ without uh, an income. But in that, you know, some people have helped me and my family and provide the things that I need. But that doesn't come without guilt or shame. That doesn't come without a, a price. And we see in the world, this world that everything is ran by the ruler of this world, money. The, the root of money is evil, and yet evil rules over the world, money. Money decides everything. And in all of our lives, we, we see that uh, what is tormenting to our lives in, in today's world? Same with them, what torments us in, in life? If, Sin itself is the punishment. 
right? So, so <clears throat> they were receiving punishment all the while there in those last years in, in Egypt. And, and when they cried out for help, God heard. All right, so receiving punishment so long as there's no cry for help. And when do we cry for help? When we're at the bottom of the barrel, we're and out in the gutter, you know, all of a sudden, we, we see like in Egypt, you know, there, all the people were forced to uh, give up their children and began to kill their own children. And Egypt says, you know, out of fear that the Israelites are going to overpopulate Egypt and just take it over purely by uh, means of overpopulating it. They come and, and say, we're going to kill the firstborns. And throw them into the, the Nile River where the alligators can eat them up, right? And but one faithful person prays over Moses, puts him in a nice basket, and there he goes on down the river. Now one of the Egyptian princesses pulls him out of the river and gives him the name Moses. And so we know today that the name Moses, right, means drawn out of the water. Why do we get baptized? Why did Jesus Christ come to John the Baptist to, to be baptized? And John, I ain't gonna baptize you, no way. Like, Aren't you supposed to baptize me? Right? So we're gonna see how John the Baptist, Jesus, Moses, Aaron, how it's all related, right? And Jesus says to fulfill the words so that all righteousness it may come and be manifested into the light, we will do these things. So John was persuaded, baptizes Jesus, and from out of the water, drawn out of the water, right, comes Israel, or, or God's firstborn, right? So we see that everything Jesus did and everything John the Baptist did <coughs> lines up perfectly with Moses and Aaron come to our life. Same thing. Everything that Jesus did and John the Baptist did is all related into our lives, into how salvation works and what's going on. So we see <coughs> that Moses later in the story talks about how there will be a prophet raised up from amongst their own people. And anybody who don't listen to that prophet will be cut off. And that will be a testimony and a witness to the unbelief of the people. Right? So, John the Baptist is that prophet. Right? Jesus is no prophet. And just like John the Baptist, everything John the Baptist said about Jesus came true, was truth. Everything Moses said uh, about God came truth, was truth, right? So we wonder in our world and in our life, what's causing our pains and our affliction? What's uh, agitating us? Well, sin, right? Sin, imperfection of that sin itself is the punishment. That that's the punishment that God has given to each of us. That you know, if we sin, that then we are uh, punished by the actions of sin. Right? All these things is working in our lives today. And you say, how? Well, for a person out there who is angry, then anger is their punishment. And if a person out there, that's tormenting. Especially if you're angry all day long, that's tormenting to that person. Same with the person who is depressed, right? That depression, that self-loathing, that feeling of, of self or worthlessness, that itself is punishing to that person, right? Greed. Greed is punishing to those who are greedy because they can't sleep day or night because they're always worried about their stuff, their things, or, or their money. And, and it's punishing to those who have nothing. Being poor. Being poor. If you're poor and you go five years without any income, 
it's very grievous, and that itself can be very punishing. You know, it's it's sad to go out into the world today, and we all claim to know Jesus. We all have the same mind of Jesus, the same soul and spirit of Jesus. We we have one body with Jesus. Yet the only person who cares about this body is me. Me. The only one who cares whether this body is clothed or, or fed is me. And I care when it's 20 below out and I'm naked outside. I, I care. Now, nobody else may care. Everybody wants a personal relationship with God. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ is how we gain salvation. Yet, I don't want a personal relationship with you or, or me or him or... Yet, how do we reject each other and not reject God? So, so, sin is the punishment. Nobody loves each other. Nobody cares for anybody. They're truly, as the Bible says, we will only be lovers of ourselves. I only have enough love for me and, and what I'm going through and my problems and whatever it is. And I don't have room to love someone else. Right? And that's like all of us in our world. We, we all recognize our own needs. But it's hard to recognize other people's needs. I care about myself. I care when I'm hungry, right? And everybody out there starving cares when they're hungry. And everybody out there who's in a bad spot, they, they really care when, when they're in a bad spot. They care for themselves. So, so what does God teach us through our afflictions, through our sins? Wisdom. Wisdom. God is the source of wisdom. And whether we believe it or not, the, the source of, of wisdom is seen through our failures of life. Whatever those failures may be. We learn, right? We, we make a mistake, and I learn a crazy man. Crazy, and hot in his right mind, uh, keeps trying to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Kind of like Pharaoh. This crazy man, expecting to do the same thing over and over, and, and expecting a new result. Moses says, uh, Israel is God's firstborn, and he's come to deliver his son from out of your hand. And over and over, he rejects that. He rejects that as being the truth. Now, you go back in those days, and how Jesus, and it was said that if anybody doesn't accept John the Baptist, the messenger from God, go to the book of Micah, or Malachi, and there we see that if God's messenger John the Baptist is rejected, which he was ultimately thrown in prison and beheaded. Then, then the Lord would come and strike the land with a curse. Moses, rejected by Pharaoh, strikes Pharaoh's land with a curse. Jesus performs and strikes the earth with every curse Moses cursed Pharaoh with, each and every one, right? They reject Moses, get out of here, Moses, and go make and work double hard. And in fact, you start cutting your own uh, hay or grass or straw for your bricks. So obviously they had a system where the Egyptians were out or a group of people were out or one tribe was out and they would cut down the, you know, grass or, or the straw and they'd bring it to the mud pit and there you got the mud pit workers working in the mud pit and they would do their things but now they switch and say, well, you're going to cut the grass and make the bricks, right? So double portion work for you. How dare you come and say to Pharaoh, you're... you're 
protection, your, your God, your, your master, your ruler, your everything that let your people go, you know, how dare you, right? Now, now Moses strikes the water, the Nile, with blood, turns the, the water into blood. All the Egyptians see the blood, all the Egyptians are terrified by the blood, terrified, right? They're, they're gripped in fear. <clears throat> Yet all the Israelites living there in Goshen have clean water. So, yet, yet they see the fear, they see everything everybody's going through, they see the problems that the unbelievers are having in their life, and, and in that what they see, they learn wisdom. I, I, wisdom is knowing what is right. Not only knowing what is right, wisdom is the ability to choose or to have discernment to make that choice of whatever is right. What's the right choice? I walk this way, I make a mistake, I fail, and then I say, oh, that's a bad choice. I'm going to choose something different. So, he strikes the land or the water and, and turns it into blood. And, and all the Pharaoh and and the Egyptians are grieving and crying out and really upset, right? Jesus, John the Baptist, baptizes Jesus. And from out of the water comes the one drawn from water, my son, right? Now Jesus, going to strike the land with the curse, says, No longer is the water valuable because you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And fire is that of a refining fire which produces like pure gold or purity. Burns off the dross, the imperfections. All right, the, the lie or the error. Jesus changes the blood, the water into blood. No longer a, a baptism of water, but a baptism of blood. Right? Because Jesus comes to die and, and to make an atonement, one death once and for all. One death once and for all, no reincarnation, no keep coming back and keep reliving all the torments and then the problems of the earth. You get one life. And in this one life, there's one death. And there's one resurrection. And everybody partakes in the resurrection has life. Now, so he turns that into blood, right? And we all hate that here in our world. That, that's, some people see that in blood, the, the death, it's not good enough. <laughs> you know, it's not good enough. But I, I need to add more to this uh, thing or, or whatever it may be. Creating uh, our own way of salvation. God's word isn't enough. It's not enough. I, I gotta create my own salvation. I can't trust in God's word, so I'm going to take it upon myself to make a new wor word, or a new way, or a new God. Because the true God isn't trustworthy. And even though pains and sufferings are being poured out on the Egyptians, they see the torment, and the Israelites surrender to God, right? They surrender. We, we trust you. And what do they trust them with? Their lives. He's going to remove us or, or take us out of Egypt, this place of weeping and gnashing of the teeth, this place of slavery, right? Today we know we're, we are all slaves to sin, <laughs> We're all slaves to sin. And so Jesus comes to take us out. I've seen the affliction. It's come upon you. The pain and the suffering that sin causes. Right? And sin was the reward for Adam and Eve's untrusting in God. Right? Death entered through Adam and the wages of sin. Not to believe in God brought death to all the world, right? Now, the Egyptians had many gods, 
many gods and they worshipped uh, hundreds and thousands of different gods, but they did not worship the unseen God. Right? No, I, I worship Pharaoh, who's God. I can see him. I can worship the gods of amphibious animals, frogs. I can worship the god of frogs because I can see frogs. And when I see frogs and the life of frogs, it's very beautiful and very intriguing. And surely there's, there's a god who rules over all frogs. Same with the bugs and the flies and, and the birds and beasts and, and yeah there's a god who controlled the winds and the waves there, there was a god who did this there's a god who created the sun but but in that they were all different gods not one god but many different gods and they all made up gods for their own liking through their own foolishness even though they wanted to know if there was a God, they would they would have loved to have a personal relationship with God, but they had never met God. So they created their own gods. Now, Moses says, well, seems how you guys worship the, uh, you know, God of fleas. Going to send fleas on you. And you pray to your God of the fleas and have him deliver you since you worship that God. And they couldn't be delivered, and the fleas themselves, right? And God showed them mercy because God obviously could have just went down and grabbed them by the palm of his hand and heaved them into a fiery pit of hell, but instead, being slow to anger and great in mercy, sends these things upon them that were terrifying to them because of what was terrifying? I prayed for the fleas to leave us, but... They wouldn't leave. The, the God I trusted in has abandoned me. And it's like a, like a bowl full of thorns and...